non-tumorous nodular, hyperplastic and hypertrophic lesions of the oral mucosa. Of the non-tumorous nodular, hyperplastic and hypertrophic lesions of the oral mucosa, the following may be mentioned. Foreign body inclusions, infections originating in the dentition, bones and mucosa, chronic traumas and inflammatory processes. This is an example of a foreign body in the lip, a grenade splinter that the patient did not consider pathological. It doesn't cause any discomfort. The fragment is completely encysted, asymptomatic. Its exeresis is unnecessary. This is a secondary foreign body with calcification in Stenson's excretory duct. It is a lithiasis, which often has a yellowish-white appearance. The most common site is Wharton's duct on the floor of the mouth, as shown in the bottom photo. An example of an exogenous foreign body caused by dental treatment. In this case, the dentist practitioner carried out a treatment involving the construction of a temporary resin crown and part of the resin stuck to the cheek, as can be seen on the CT scan. It was subsequently removed because of discomfort accompanied by an inflammatory reaction. An infection of the ducts of the major salivary glands can progress to a swelling, in this case, Cielodocitis of the right submandibular gland can be observed. Palpation of the gland causes a small quantity of pus to seep out. Treatment is based on delivering an antiseptic into the canal. Lesions resulting from a dental infection can develop into mucosal swelling, a granulomatous reaction with various degrees of fistula formation. In this case, the dental examination will allow the diagnosis to be made. This is a subperiosteal palatine abscess of dental origin, secondary to an impact which led to dental necrosis, which became secondarily superinfected. Searching for and catheterizing the fistula tract enables the tooth responsible for the lesion to be identified. This is visualized here on the radiograph at the point indicated by the arrow. Swellings may result from osseous necrosis, in particular osteochemonecrosis, which is currently caused by anti-resorptive agents, biphosphonates and anti-rank ligand antibodies used in cancer treatment. An osseous sequestrum is generally complicated by a superinfection which causes mucosal swelling. Gingivitis caused by biofilms classically produces swellings of the interdental papillae. Gingival Infections can be increased by some medications such as calcium channel blockers, cyclosporine, and further back, phenytoins, which cause gingival hyperplasia. This is only mildly inflammatory in comparison with biofilm-induced gingivitis. Finally, infections of cutaneous origin may also occur. Here is a case of labial cellulitis, which began in the skin. Infections involve viruses as well as bacteria. HPV infections may be reasonable for lesions of the oral mucosa, known as papillomas, warts or condylomata. Lesions caused by the pox virus, molluscum condagiosum, can also be observed, but they are much less common than on the skin. They are often observed on the oral mucosa in a context of immunosuppression. 
papillary hyperplasia is an inflammatory pathology of the palate, often caused by a sucking mannerism, which causes a trauma that is responsible for hyperplasia and palatine erythema. Diapneusia, this is an extremely common lesion. This is a hernia of the mucosa through an interdental space caused by suction. As a general rule, an axeresis is performed as patients have a tendency to bite their mucosal protuberances. Epulis fissuratum. This is also a hyperplastic traumatic lesion caused by instability of a prosthesis. It's also known as epulis or hyperplasia, resembling the pages of a book. Epulis fissuratum may assume enormous proportions where there is a marked instability of a prosthesis. Here we see numerous nodules on the cheek caused by an unstable prosthesis. Ceasing to wear the prosthesis for two months allowed the lesions to heal. Finally, these epulis lesions, which can also be called pyogenic granuloma, telangiectatic granuloma, soft wart, correspond to granulomas with a local cause linked to dental caries, as in the previous case. These forms of epulis are favoured by systemic factors, in particular hormonal factors during pregnancy. Epulitic lesions are frequently observed in relation to local dental or periodontal lesions. Another example of epulis in pregnancy. The lesion can be seen to be extremely inflammatory and vascularized. Generally, these lesions disappear after childbirth, but surgical exeresis may be required. Post-extraction epulis. This is an inflammatory granuloma secondary to a tooth extraction. The patient was seen again a few weeks after the extraction and there was persisting inflammatory tissue in the alveolus. Simple curatage will allow healing to take place. There is a specific form of swelling caused by trauma known as a traumatic eosinophilic ulcer. Generally, these are large swellings observed principally on the tongue which are rich in eosinophils and which can be mistaken clinically for a malignant tumour. Finally, swellings can be observed in the context of an inflammatory process, particularly orofacial granulomatosis, which may or may not be associated with a cr chronic inflammatory bowel disease. The most common manifestation is macrocalitis, and sometimes there may also be an infiltration of oral cavity tissues, as here in the gingiva. Treatment of macrocalitis is based on corticosteroid injections. It can be seen that repeat injections of the lips with triamcinolone has allowed the granulomatose lesions to heal and disappear. These granulomatous lesions can also be observed as part of Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome, where facial paralysis combined with scrotal tongue and macrocalitis is observed. Finally, edema may occur in the context of allergic and infectious processes. When diagnosing facial edemas, excluding the classic Quinker's edema, which is an allergic reaction, the possibility of an angioneurotic edema linked to a C1INH deficiency should be considered.